this will be very informal, and we'll cut, we cut and edit, of course, and yeah. so forth. So I suppose we just go, uh, in order to save time, we'll just go, uh, go right into this, and uh, uh, I'll identify the, the film as being taken uh, uh, in the home of uh, Dr. Huff uh, at, uh, in Los Altos Hills, California, on December 20. 2nd, 1988, and uh, uh, with this, uh, Dr. Huff, we'll, uh, uh, we'd like to uh, have you describe uh, some of your career, which has led to uh, these very important uh, advances uh, in the field of uh, uh, microprocessing and other important fields uh, in uh, the field of electronics. And so with this, uh, uh, would you please uh, start at this point? Well, let's see. Uh, I guess we should probably start at the beginning. Um, I was born in Rochester, New York, uh, back in 1937. And um, I uh, grew up in a small town outside of Rochester, um, went to a very small high school. Um, I was... Churchville High School, later Churchville Chile Central School. That's Rome. interesting, uh, because what, what size high school was it? Uh, our graduating class was about 37 students. Oh yes, that was uh, a very small high school, about the same size yeah. high school I graduated <laughs> from. I was, I was fortunate enough to have some very um, might say interesting and interested science teachers, although I've been interested in science um, probably from about the time I was six years old. I think I had a, a, a cousin who was um, a year older than I was who got a chemistry set when he was uh, uh, probably about seven or, or so. And my uncle, my father's brother, who was about 17 years younger than my father, so he wasn't that much older yeah. than I was, um, was a uh, chemical engineering student at the University of Rochester. So with these contacts, um, chemistry seemed to look like a fascinating field. I mean, it had a lot of qualities of magic uh, to it. So I studied a lot of chemistry um, even before I was in high school. And I met um, a science teacher. Uh, that was a Mr. Griffiths, I believe his name was, uh, when I was a freshman in high school. And he found out that I knew quite a bit about chemistry. We started a science club. Uh, he was a, a sponsor. Did. And he suggested I take the New York State Regents test in chemistry at the end of my freshman year without having taken the course. <laughs> oh, yes. That's and, a very interesting <clears throat> point. So uh, I did reasonably well, and I got 95 out of 100 in, well, the, in, the, in the test. Well, that's very startling because we all know that the New York Regents tests are were the <laughs> toughest in the nation as far as state tests are concerned. And so that's a very, very interesting uh, point. And also it uh, illustrates the point at which I found that uh, the inspiration for some of the mem prominent members that have gone into science, even have won Nobel Prizes, uh, have been high school uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting point yeah. you raise. And later... Um, uh, uh, we got a new science teacher, Mr. Broccoli, and um, there were two students there uh, who were very interested in science, another fellow named Paul Milley, and uh, Mr. Broccoli suggested that uh, we enter the Westinghouse uh, science talent search. Oh, yes. And, um, and I managed to win a trip to uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, yes. In uh, 1954. <laughs> well, uh, as a matter of fact... Uh, that's a, uh, I, I, al I always uh, attend the exhibits in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, living in Washington, mm -hmm. and it's always uh, fascinating uh, to see those. As a matter of fact, uh, my, uh, uh, my nephew uh, entered uh, that contest and made the trip to Washington, I think it was about 1952, and mm -hmm. so I, I have followed with interest to Westinghouse <laughs> Science uh, so, a talent search ever since, yeah. so that's a very... What was the subject of your exhibit? <laughs> well, my topic was that uh, supplies of petroleum are finite. 
Oh, yeah. And so, therefore, um, it would be interesting to mm -hmm. see if there are things that we can do to make petroleum substitutes. Oh, yeah. And so... You're about 30 years ahead of your time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in <laughs> fact, we uh, built an apparatus using... Um, uh, in fact, what I was interested in is using carbon dioxide and hydrogen and looking at um, catalytic reactions. And we made an apparatus with um, using a cobalt catalyst uh, dispersed on a, I believe it was on like a fiberglass um, uh, you know, carrier to see if we could uh, produce some uh, reaction between hydrogen and carbon dioxide. I don't know if we ever got any. Uh, it smelled a little <laughs> bit like hydrocarbons, but we could never really uh, mm -hmm. uh, demonstrate that we'd accomplished. But it was it was yeah, good for a, for that's a trip. A very say it was it, it was. Um, it was probably a little bit. <laughs> it was a very yeah, ambitious uh, yeah, project, yeah. but very, uh, very interesting. In fact, one of the most ambitious things was that we took the apparatus to Washington. Oh, I yeah. mean, this was, my father helped build a, a big carton, or actually a wooden crate, and we oh. shipped all this glass and tubing and everything down to, uh, down to Washington for the, for the show. And oh, yeah. set it up and demonstrate it at, the, oh. uh, at, at one of the festivities at the... Yeah. Uh, that, you know that they sponsor there, <laughs> but it was um, it was a it was a good start. But uh, about the time um, I was uh, getting ready to go to college, um, I talked quite a bit to my uncle, and he felt that there was a good um, you know, good job potential in chemical engineering, but not in chemistry itself. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't that interested in chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. I liked the um, what I felt to be the more creative aspects oh, of yeah. chemistry. But I had been interested in in electronics. In fact, my uncle in 1949 got me a subscription to Popular Science magazine, and I saw oh, an yeah. ad for I think it was the Allied Electronics uh, oh, yeah. catalog. Mm -hmm. and sent away for that, and then that got me started in electronics, and I built some kits and things like that. In fact, um, eventually uh, I built my own uh, oscilloscope. Mm -hmm. um, and with, uh, you know, with the input from my uncle, it seemed that you know, perhaps chemistry wasn't the field to go mm -hmm. in, and electronics was developing, and computers were coming along. Oh, yeah. And so... When it came time to go to college, uh, I felt that uh, maybe I should go into electronics instead of chemistry. Oh, yes. And uh, I applied a number of places, but ended up um, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, my father worked for General Railway Signal Company, mm -hmm. and um, I believe it was like the chairman of the board was also on the board of directors at Rensselaer, and he offered a scholarship mm -hmm. um, to employees of uh, General Railway Signal, mm -hmm. and uh, I won uh, the scholarship, and so that that helped uh, provide for, for RPI. Oh, yes. And um, also, um, of course, the Westinghouse uh, was, a, was a small amount uh, contributed. I ended up somewhere between 4th and 10th, I think, in the, in oh, the yeah. competition. And I uh, had the New York State Scholarship, too. So uh, altogether, the college was pretty well taken care of uh, with, the, with the scholarships. Um, and um, I had the advantage that I'd studied quite a bit of both electronics and chemistry, so it gave me something of a head start. Uh, at that time, we had quite a few of the students at RPI were um, uh, Korean war veterans who mm -hmm. were... Uh, you know, going on you know, one of the GI programs, mm -hmm. and uh, always was very impressed with those fellows. I mean, they had um, they worked very hard, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they were much more mature than the typical college student, having you know been through uh, you know through the military service. But um, in the in the long run, I felt RPI had a way of of teaching. Uh, that they called the problem-solving approach, and it it didn't it didn't provide enough of what I felt to be the, the fundamental background. I was interested in the the why things work, in other words, and just 
solving uh, a problem or learning a formula that you can apply, which I think was really a traditional engineering mm -hmm. approach at that time, uh, wasn't, um, it wasn't as satisfying as I felt uh, it could be. So when it came time to consider graduate work, I felt that I wanted to try something other than an engineering school. Oh yeah, and I was interested. It was that the, your field of discipline was electrical engineering. Electrical engineering, then, presumably, and, and it was pretty. <clears throat> and it was more a tra little traditional, perhaps. Uh, well, it had been, but it, uh -huh. see, it was on the on the verge of a of a major change. Oh yes, um, electrical engineering had originally been power engineering, oh, transformers yes. and mm -hmm. motors, and um, what you know, fifty, hundred years of uh, of tradition there. With World War II and the development of radar and the explosion of electronics and the importance of it, there had been a, a developing, um, you know, uh, you know, whole, almost like a whole new field. And then uh, the development of the transistor oh, yes. was was creating a, another revolution in electronics, oh, yeah. and. The um, one of the uh, situations, uh, again, partly uh, due to my father, who worked at General Electric Signal Company, uh, when I when I uh, was during the summer after graduating from high school and waiting to go to RPI, I was looking around for summer work, and I tried a few, you know, what I call menial jobs, and. My father suggested to uh, one of the people at work that you know, he had the son that was interested in electronics and might they have a position in the lab for me. And they said, oh, they talked to me. And so I went in and interviewed, and they said certainly they'd, they'd hire me for the summer. And so I found myself working with transistors. In other words, this was... Um, what year a, was this? <clears throat> this was 1954. Oh, yes, and they're just big. Well, they were going to be develop. available, right? Um, well, originally well, they had the point contact transistors, yes. and then uh, the junction transistors were uh, oh, yes. just on, and they were still quite expensive. Oh yes, and in fact, they were they were not that well understood. As an example, we were using germanium transistors, yeah, and the ones we had been using, um, I believe, were made by a company called CBS Hytron, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they were packaged in a metal can. And then, apparently as a cost savings measure, um, they started packaging them in plastic. And we received a, a batch of transistors, and they had been changed from the metal can to plastic. Mm -hmm. And one of the jobs I had was testing them for a leakage current. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was called the cutoff current of the transistor. And... Uh, Although they were germanium, uh, the railway system had a temperature constraint. This was for a signaling system used mm -hmm. in a railway, railroad cab, mm -hmm. a locomotive cab. And the, uh, the measurement was 10 microamps maximum at room temperature that they could have. And 19 out of 20 transistors in this lot in plastic, mm. over 100 microamps. In other words, there was something about the pla packaging in plastic that was not adequate for the transistor. And up to that time, everybody had been saying, there's no reason for a transistor to fail. Oh, yes. Well, they were discovering mm -hmm. you know, potential reliability mm -hmm. problems, and of course, the, they're much better understood today. Than yeah. they and were. those were the germanium transistors. Those were germanium. At that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've also learned about corrosion problems oh, and the yes. like, and, and other, and other transistors. But it was quite exciting working with the transistor, and um, the um, as I say at, at at RPI, most of the faculty were long-term people, and they were not uh, not really well versed in the in the area of transistors. They had not moved into the into that area uh, too well. So, but they did give a a good background and, and you know the fundamentals of electronics and electron ballistics and so on. So when it came time to consider graduate work, I thought um, I'd like to 
find uh, some place that perhaps is more first away from the engineering college, a little more broadly based, and uh, with a better background in solid state uh, electronics. And somehow Stanford University uh, was brought to my attention, and um, it uh, sounded appealing for, for a number of reasons. And in fact, um, when I was uh, a senior uh, at RPI, uh, as a senior, I had an option to do uh, an undergraduate thesis. And I had been working um, with uh, some power transistors and noticed how slow they were and some funny behaviors in, um, in switching, um, you know, long storage times and the like. And so uh, I did a, chose to do a thesis in that area. And in the course of doing the thesis, I found that the classic paper in that field at that time were by two people from Bell Labs named uh, Ebers and Moll. And um, when I came to Stanford, I found that John Moll had just come to, uh, to Stanford to teach. So mm -hmm. I was uh, one of the students in his course. I found it very, very impressive. And then um, I was... Um, I had gotten interested in pattern recognition. The question was posed, could we build something that would read the numbers off a boxcar as it mm -hmm. went by? Oh, yeah. There was a problem in a railroad to keep mm -hmm. track of where all the cars are. Sure. So I mentioned this to um, one of the professors at uh, Stanford, and he suggested I talk to uh, a professor who had just come to Stanford from MIT named Bernie Woodrow. And uh, Bernie Woodrow uh, was interested in pattern recognition and, in particular, adaptive elements. So I started off working in the area of uh, what today would be called neural nets, although mm -hmm. in those days we called them adaptive switching circuits. And uh, we did use the term neuron, though. <coughs> and after getting my degree, I stayed on at Stanford for six years. And I worked in that area. Um, and um, doing research primarily. And also, um, I'd been interested in integrated circuits, and I'd had some contacts with people on the faculty and, and others um, in, in that field. And then one day I got a call from a, a fellow who I had, uh, I had heard of, and I think I had met once before, a fellow named Bob Noyce. Oh yes. So when he when he identified himself, I knew who he was, and uh, he said that they were starting a new company, and um, they were looking for somebody who had some uh, feeling for systems, and oh, would yes. I be interested? And but that, uh, back uh, uh, back at Stanford, uh, uh, was was Shockley on the faculty then also? Uh, during the time uh, you were there? No, I think he probably he joined after I left, or he may have mm -hmm. been... Um, I See, he had that company which eventually became Clevite Semiconductor. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm not sure when he joined uh, oh, yes. the Stanford mm -hmm. faculty. It, it may have been toward the, the end of the... Of the so you period. didn't quite overlap him. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. And, I, and I was not, my position was not a faculty position. Mm -hmm. I was uh, in a research position. Oh, yes. Although I did work with Bernie Woodrow and we, we mm -hmm. taught a course um, that was sort of a computer uh, lab course. Oh, yes. say, uh, that we, uh, uh, it was quite an interesting, uh, uh, almost like an independent study in an organized way uh, for a variety of students. But um, Intel sounded, uh, you know, like an interesting uh, challenge. And in fact, um, I, I had been talking to um, uh, another uh, a number of people at Stanford about, you know, it seemed like semiconductor, um, uh, you know, should be capable of making fairly large uh, memory uh, chips. So one of the questions I was asked in the interview with, uh, with Bob Noyce is, where did I think the next big step for semiconductors uh, would be? And I said, memory. And that was the right answer, because oh, yeah. that's what Intel mm -hmm. was, had set out to do. Yes, because, uh, let's see, at that time, 
as I remember it, the the memory that IBM uh, these these wound fair was the ferrite, and ferrite cores and so forth, uh, just on and off. <clears throat> and they had they were making parts with a few flip flops in them. Uh -huh. So to some extent, you can consider it a memory, but maybe eight bits at a time yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. And there were some that were starting up a little bit, uh, a little bit beyond that. And in fact, um, I have a clipping from the. I don't know if you want oh yes, to hold it up here. But there's a, right. a a clipping. Two founders leave uh, Fairchild and form own electronics firm, and this is dated uh, Friday, August second, nineteen sixty-eight. Oh yeah, uh, and who are the? Uh, That's Bob Noyce, Noyce and Gordon Moore. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, the uh, the company really uh, had a place to to meet as of uh, September of 1968. And, oh yeah, that's, that's when I joined them. I became employee number twelve. Oh yeah. And my initial assignments were to um, to help develop. Um, applications aid for uh, semiconductor memory. And in fact, there were a number of, of memory designs that were being started. And one of the things I always wished I had at least tried to patent, I, I can't be sure that I uh, really invented it, but um, at least the first memory chips that were being done at Intel did not have a chip select lead on them. And I suggested that they put a chip select, an enable lead, so you could wire the memory chips together. I think that would have been a very important path. Oh, yeah. Could have gotten it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But um, we developed um, a variety of semiconductor memories, and I developed and wrote things like the 1103 uh, handbook. In other oh, yeah. And it's. And this is the kind of application information that. Uh, that my my group was uh, intended to produce. Fine. If we could back up just a, a moment sure. on this development, because this is very fascinating development. Of course, the uh, the original uh, uh, memory back in the relay days, uh, mm -hmm. you, you had the you had essentially the flip flop relay right. as, uh, as yeah. a as a, as a memory bit, and then they uh, and then it was the ferrite cores of right. IBM and. Uh, and there were a number of other and, techniques that were tried, storage all, tubes, and there, there of course were, there were magnetic drums, uh, which of course have continued to be yes, used, and, uh, so, uh, acoustic delay lines. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, all of those things are uh, so, uh, so expensive, a lot of them involve a lot of ha hand labor, which was very expensive in order to... Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. There was work going on to try to produce uh, thin film memories, mm -hmm. and the, um, the there were difficulties though because mm -hmm. the signals one got were very small and it was oh, yeah. hard to make a reliable one. But I know there was quite a bit of effort in that area until mm -hmm. the semiconductor finally, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, eventually, looked so attractive compared to the, the thin films that the bulk of the thin film yeah. work was dropped. Uh, and where essentially, uh, where was the first uh, uh, semiconductor memory or transistor memory developed? And, and it's roughly That's, it's hard form. to say where the first yeah. one came from. Mm -hmm. um, there were there were efforts. I mean, as I mentioned, the flip flop would have been the first memory. So yeah. one of the early integrated circuits with a flip flop probably would have counted as the first yeah. you know, one bit memory. Uh, people were starting to build small arrays, primarily for use as registers and computers. And the um, th most of the memories were not at that time considered as mainframe, you know, replacement for 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 core memory. The 1103, uh, in a sense, was targeted to be the first memory for use in a, in a mainframe. And there were other companies that were attempting to develop, you might say, their equivalent, um, you know, the one k-bit memory. <clears throat> so um, these were done using uh, uh, NMOS uh, technology. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, a, I think there were, let's see, there was a company called AMS. There was a, a company uh, that was a spin-off from uh, IBM called Kogar. And um, 
but uh, uh, Intel was one of the early ones. I don't know whether we were necessarily the the first, um, uh, you know, with a memory of that capacity, but we were certainly right. uh, in a leadership uh, position. And <clears throat> it was partly uh, because of my work in, in memory and systems that uh, got me involved in, a, in another role in the, in the company. And that was um, Intel recognized that they were developing proprietary products. And proprietary products have uh, an advantage in a large market, but it's a market that's slow to develop. Because your customer, after he hears about your product, then begins the design cycle. And it's quite some time before the, the product is actually going to be sold in large volumes because he has to go through his design cycle. So it was felt that perhaps to take on some custom uh, work where you are working closely with your customer during the design of the integrated circuit. So that then when the integrated circuit is ready to come off the integrated circuit manufacturing line, the customer is presumably ready to use it in his system. And it shortens the, the cycle, at least that period of time, from when the integrated circuit is available until it's in mass production. And one of the potential customers was a Japanese calculator company. And that was, uh, went under several names. There were several different corporate mm -hmm. entities, apparently, that were involved. But eventually, uh, we knew it as Busycom. <clears throat> and the, um, the calculator company came to us with a, a f almost complete design. Uh, it was a family of calculators that they were attempting to build. And they ranged from... Uh, a display type calculator. All of these were desktop models. But from a small unit with display only, a small unit that would be printer only, up to some fairly large uh, units that would combine both printer and electronic display. To customize the family, they had chosen to use read-only memory. And uh, one family of chips was to serve the entire calculator line. The only trouble was that there were some fairly um, severe cost constraints, and they had a design for this family that would involve something like 10 or 12 different chips, many of which were going to be in uh, 36 or 40 lead packages, and those packages were quite expensive in those days. <clears throat> so, I was assigned to work with a team of Japanese engineers that came over to, uh, to work at Intel on the completion of the design. And after working with them for a while, I began to realize that the project was going to have some problems. And so, um, one of the things uh, it seemed was that they were not making very good use of that read-only memory. Uh, what they had as a, a basic step in read-only memory would be like pushing a button on a calculator. In other words, uh, the, um, in effect, one instruction might have been like a floating point addition. And I suggested, why not use subroutines? And if you can call a subroutine, you could probably, uh, you'd end up using more read-only memory, but you could save an awful lot of the random logic in the system. Mm -hmm. And um, the general response was, uh, leave us alone. We know what yeah. we're doing. <clears throat> and yeah. um, you don't know anything about calculators. So <laughs> go away. <laughs> so, but I talked to uh, people at, at Intel, primarily Bob Noyce, uh, who was the uh, president of the company at the time, and, uh, and Les uh, Vadez, who was in charge of the MOS uh, design uh, group that would have responsibility for ultimately uh, designing the silicon from the schematics that this Japanese engineering team was doing. 
And the, um, the reaction was, uh, well, if you think you've got a better idea, why don't you pursue it? You know, it's always nice to have an insurance policy. <clears throat> so I proceeded and um, eventually um, came up with uh, essentially uh, a very small, uh, crude, uh, general purpose computer that had uh, uh, a fairly simple instruction set and worked with 4-bit uh, quantities. And the 4-bit quantity uh, seemed reasonable. Um, the display they were using was be have, would have maybe 15 digits, and if you use a 14-bit quantity, you can count up to 16 if you work in binary. In fact, I proposed that it be a binary machine and uh, added instructions to do decimal arithmetic. There's primarily one instruction that's called decimal adjust accumulator. Mm -hmm. And um, the um, uh, basic concepts were developed around July and August of 1969. And again, the response was uh, not you know, there was very little interest on the part of the Japanese, a lot of uh, objections. In fact, one of the objections was um, while the calculator was calculating, they wanted the, uh, the lights to blink. In other words, it was a, like a Nixie tube type display. And <clears throat> they felt that well, if I used the processor technique, the lights wouldn't be blinking. The processor would be off doing its own thing. And so well, I showed they could write a program that would blink the lights. It would slow the, the uh, computing down a little bit. Uh, and I showed that you could scan the keyboard while you scan the display and debounce the keyboard using, using micro instructions in this machine. So uh, the uh, Japanese engineering team continued to say, well, they recognized their design had trouble and they would do a redesign that would still be a conventional calculator architecture. And there are there are there were quite a few differences. The the calculator architecture tended to work with serially organized shift register memory, where the memory would be essentially one long string of digits, uh, perhaps sixteen digits in in a row. So to access any digit, you'd have to shift through the ones in between, and it meant then it was a fairly slow process, where. Um, the uh, the architecture I was proposing was to be based on um, the type of memory cell that we were using in the 1103, which was a random access uh, a dynamic cell. And that uh, we proposed to refresh as part of the instruction cycle. And, um, eventually, uh, around October of 1969, we had a presentation in which the uh, Japanese engineering team and my group, which consists primarily of myself and another engineer, mm -hmm. Stan Mazur, each presented their approaches to the Japanese uh, management mm -hmm. who had come over to the U.S. Uh, to hear this presentation. And at that time, we pointed out that our approach was much more uh, general, much more universal than the calculator design and had potential application in many other products besides the, um, the calculator. And the uh, Japanese management chose the Intel approach. I see. So that essentially put the blessing on what we called or eventually called the microcomputer approach. So um, I'm not a, an MOS uh, designer. In other words, I'd, what I knew of the design of the circuits is what I'd picked up at, at Intel, and a little bit of knowledge of MOS technology from before. Um, so my role was primarily in doing the architecture and um, then a, a later on doing support for the products. Mm -hmm. So once the architecture was done, the instruction set defined, it was turned over to the MOS design team. and They, they carried it. On from there. But in the course of, of the uh, activity, um, when the contract was signed with the Japanese, uh, even though the design approach had been developed at Intel, the contract was, uh, gave the Japanese exclusive rights mm 
to the product for use in the calculator. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, there was still no role for you know for the Intel we yeah. think of today. Uh, at that time, it was still a custom custom product. And then shortly after that, we had another contact, um, in this case, uh, primarily with this engineer who was working with me, Stan Mazer, um, a contact from a company which at the time was known as Computer Terminals Corporation. Mm -hmm. And Computer Terminals Corporation uh, um, was working on a terminal that they called the Data Point 2200. It was to be a, an intelligent terminal. And it had a, a processor in it that was based use, on TTL logic and built with something like 60 packages or so, a fairly simple processor. And they originally approached us with the idea of doing the registers uh, for that machine, a uh, custom memory chip. Mm -hmm. And in the course of studying the machine, uh, which we felt we had to do to understand how these registers would interface to the rest of the system. We realized that the processor was not significantly um, more complex than the processor that, that we had um, just defined for the calculator family. So with our marketing department's blessing, we proposed, instead of just doing the registers, why don't we do the whole processor? And that uh, eventually led to the um, what, what eventually became known as the 8008 uh, processor. And so we, um, by the end of 1969, the beginning of 1970, we actually were committed to make two different, what ultimately would be known as microcomputers. <laughs> so, um, the um, the uh, both designs went into the uh, MOS uh, uh, group, and um, in April or, or May, March or April of 1970, a fellow named uh, Frederico Fagin was hired. Uh, I believe he'd been a Fairchild, and he did the took over responsibility for the silicon design for the. Uh, calculator family, which ultimately became known as the MCS4 family, and an engineer um, named Hal Feeney had responsibility for the 8008. Uh, in fact, at that time we called it the 1201 for, mm -hmm. don't even know why I had that number, but ultimately it came out as the 8008. Uh, the MCS4 family was designed as a family of chips that all worked together and they had the memory there was a read-only memory and a read-write memory were custom-made for that particular processor. The um, 8008, on the other hand, was intended to work with standard off-the-shelf memories. Mm -hmm. uh, the only trouble was it was a fairly tricky interface to build. It took a fair number of packages of logic to interface that processor to its memory. And there were other characteristics. Um, in the case of the 8008, we'd ask ourselves if it would be possible to put an interrupt into it. Mm -hmm. And because uh, the, the 4004 MCS4 family did not have an interrupt. It had, did, if it was going to interact with the outside world, it did it by polling. Mm -hmm. And we came to the conclusion that the, the least we could do for an interrupt is to allow stopping the program counter. Now the program counter or instruction address counter is normally incrementing along with each instruction. Mm -hmm. By stopping it, we would <clears throat> hold it still and then we'd shove a, an instruction, which would typically be a call instruction mm -hmm. to a subroutine, into the machine and a call um, would put the current instruction onto a stack, and then when we return from that routine, we would pop off the, the instruction counter, and if it hadn't advanced, it would still be pointing to the instruction it wanted in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that meant we could, we could shove a whole sequence of instructions in and get back to where we were. So that we felt that was the element of an interrupt. And um, what happened ultimately when these products came out is our customers uh, 
found that it was a lot more difficult to implement such a thing, and they wanted it done right. And of course, that gave us a lot of feedback, which ultimately led to the design of the 880, which I think was probably the first really successful and really, uh, in, you know, uh, powerful uh, microprocessor. <coughs> See, the 8080, I think, was the, really the, the workhorse for a long that time. That was the workhorse, of, yeah. Uh, of, uh, many different approaches to computers. But if you, um, if you look at what happened, now the, the, um, each, each seemed to carve out its own, own market, and they all seemed to be quite successful. And there were, um, there were some interesting, interesting uh, reactions and so on that we had um, from a variety of things when we announced the, the microprocessor. Uh, there was a uh, conference held um, in, uh, I think it was the fall of 1971, and we had just announced the uh, MCS4 family. In fact, we have a, have a, this is a copy of the ad that was used to announce the, oh, yes. the uh, MCS4. And uh, Intel had a booth at uh, this conference, the Fall Joint Computer Conference in Las Vegas. And I was told about one customer who came in and was adamant that you know, we had such nerve claiming we had a computer. And one of the engineers handed him a data sheet and he took a look at it, looked it over and he said, God, it really is a computer. Oh, <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was something that people did not believe possible at the, at the time. But that's pretty much how it got started. Yeah. The um, the one of the uh, roles that I played, I think, was also um, even after the uh, uh, you know, initial concept was later on. Um, there was a general reluctance to uh, consider the microprocessor as a fully released product, and. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we had the original contracts had given exclusive rights to the uh, MCS4 family to the um, Japanese calculator company, and that eventually, um, in exchange for some uh, cost uh, reduction, uh, was negotiated that we would have the right to sell to other people. And the original contract with um, computer terminals. Um, Later known as Data Point, um, did allow us to sell to other people, but there was a reluctance on the part of marketing to um, to offer the products. A general uh, fear of the uh, problems of support and so on. And so one of the th and one of the things my group had responsibility for was to try to develop support for these products. And um, that was not easy because in those days, prestige in the computer world was determined by how big a computer you got to program. Mm -hmm. And so if you, um, uh, you try to hire somebody, uh, you know, bright, young, promising uh, computer science graduate mm -hmm. from college, and I had one fellow come into the office and he said, well, what size 360 will I get to program? And I said, we're not talking about a 360, much smaller machine. He says, then I'm not interested. <laughs> so well, uh, just the point right. entirely. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, that's uh, uh, now at that particular stage, uh, this then began to open up the whole the whole field of, of microcomputers. Uh, what what are some of the milestones that uh, this eighty what is it eighty eighty opened up? Uh, what were, well, what are some okay the the um, the four thousand four and eight thousand eight the two mm -hmm. original yeah. products really started developing the market, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of um, a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that surprised us was that even after the 8080, which was a much more powerful processor, came out, mm -hmm. the, uh, the sales of the other products didn't drop off. They, mm -hmm. they may have leveled off, but they, mm -hmm. they really didn't go away. And the 8080 just took off uh, oh, yeah. with, uh, with much larger uh, sales. And it, it, um, uh, it 
there were so many applications that uh, it's just hard to uh, yeah. hard to enumerate them all. And the uh, in fact, one of the things we did uh, fairly early on uh, was to develop a, a user's manual for oh, the. Yeah. This was for the uh, 4004 family, or the MCS4 uh -huh. family. Now, this one was dated July of 1972, so it was you know, just about um, half a year after the, the product was announced. The, um, and then in 19, around 1974, which was about the time the um, 8080 was uh, coming out and taking off, um, I really left the microprocessor mm -hmm. area. It had been one of my responsibilities oh, yeah. at Intel was really to develop new product mm -hmm. areas. I worked um, on a uh, design for a bipolar family for a while, and we did actually announce it, but it was it was not announced. Um, in fact, we had a we did not really do our homework in terms of having good contact with marketing and where the product was going, and so. Uh, our original view was that we would do a, uh, a bipolar family that would be compatible with the 8080 at the high-level language level, at the PLM level. And we did it in a, as a microprogrammed product, um, primarily to minimize the cost of the design, and it seemed like that was a more optimal design in a bipolar family. Unfortunately, um, it was... It was felt by the company that they really could not afford to fully support another uh, full uh, family of products. And so the bipolar product was announced essentially as a microprogrammable set, and it was up to the customer to do all the mm -hmm. microprogramming. And mm -hmm. the support tools were limited and so on. And so uh, that was not a very successful uh, family. Yeah. But now uh, <clears throat> with your in opening up this whole general field of microprocessing, you know, then uh, that uh, there were several uh, microcomputers then that began to uh, appear on the market, some in the form of kits, I guess, like Altair and some Apple, and I believe uh, Commodore had a elementary form of computer, and then few years later, Radio Shack. How are those related to the microprocessor? Well, probably, of course, the Altair was, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's the one that was made possible by the 8080. 8080, that was and, directly uh, responsible. The, um, the, uh, there were a number of other uh, machines, and then eventually uh, uh, a bus called the S100 bus that became mm -hmm. sort of standard yeah. in the... Uh, somewhere between the hobby market and, mm -hmm, yeah. and and today's personal computer market there were a whole range of of machines um but um the um you know then of course there were the apple line that were based on a you know yeah. a different product a competitor's mm -hmm. uh, product and mm -hmm. um uh eventually um the uh you know the ibm personal computer yeah. based on uh, what was a uh, an upgrade, effectively, of the 8080 family, mm -hmm. the, the 8086. And, oh, yeah. <clears throat> but, as I say, I was um, off in another direction. You were off About 1975, right? yeah. um, working on a telecommunications product family. Mm -hmm. And we um, developed what I believe was the first monolithic codec, uh, analog to digital converter for use in the telephone industry mm -hmm. and on one chip we had uh, the the a to d conversion mm -hmm. and the d to a conversion mm -hmm. using the uh both the uh american and the european um non-linear coding rules mm -hmm. um, these are uh converters that are sort of piecewise logarithmic uh in their in their right. uh, characteristic and we also um we're fortunate to have uh, uh, Paul Gray, a professor from Berkeley, uh, join us while he was on a sabbatical. And um, working in, in my group at Intel, he uh, developed, I believe, the first commercially available switch capacitor filter. So uh, Intel uh, had a strong position in the uh, in that telecommunications marketplace, and I believe still does. Uh, then in uh, in 1980, 
uh, they asked that group to uh, move to Arizona. And so um, I didn't want to uh, go to Arizona. I like it here in California. And so um, I was given the opportunity to start a speech recognition group. In fact, for a short while, um, I was working with um, Aria Feingold, uh, who was also interested in speech recognition. And, uh, but then the entrepreneurial bug uh, bit Aria, and he left Intel and uh, started uh, Daisy Systems. So uh, another uh, success story in the oh, yes. Silicon Valley here. Um, <clears throat> so um, the uh, uh, speech recognition group uh, developed a product in which um, essentially we had a, a board based on the 8086, and uh, it used another product which um, uh, was, you, know, you, you learn from experiences that don't work out quite the way you expected. Um, you can't really call it a success. A part we call the 2920, which I was responsible for. And uh, so I have to take the blame too, I guess. And the idea was uh, to have a microprocessor, which would be oriented towards signal processing with um, EEPROM on board, so you could program uh, a unit, and an A to D and D to A conversion on the chip. So what we had, we believed, was a, an analog uh, microprocessor. You could use this in an analog environment. And in fact, we could program it to be a modem or program it to do speech synthesis, mm -hmm. and we demonstrated this uh, uh, capability. But unfortunately, <clears throat> we found out that the world seemed to be divided, uh, at least the analog world and the digital signal processing world, seemed to be divided into two non-communicating camps. <clears throat> The analog designers wanted nothing to do with computers. Um, they were quite happy with their linear integrated circuits. And the digital signal processing people were not really interested in, in hardware unless it was a box to add on to their computer to oh, yeah. speed up the processing of uh, you know, uh, running tapes through. And there really wasn't the market for a real-time uh, product and had a few other deficiencies that um, made it so that it didn't interface well into some existing markets. So it um, it was uh, an interesting experiment, but uh, a uh, one of those learning experiences, as you say. So um, then, um, in uh, nineteen eighty three. Um, an opportunity came along at Atari to work in their, um, in fact, to head up their uh, corporate technology group, working with Alan Kay. And uh, they had a fascinating program there, but unfortunately Atari was just at the threshold of some very serious financial problems and uh, eventually was sold by Warner. And um, the, uh, so uh, that happened around July of 1984, and I've left and been an independent consultant uh, oh, yes. since that time. And in fact, uh, most recently, I've been getting back involved in neural nets after being away from it for, what, about 20 years. Oh, so. yeah. <clears throat> uh, what is your uh, current uh, interest in uh, neural nets? Well, <clears throat> it seems to be, uh, there seems to be a growing interest in the field. And I think we now have some technology, particularly available through integrated circuits, that will allow us to um, perhaps do some really interesting things uh, that, with neural nets that, that really weren't feasible 20 years ago. Um, uh, the, the possibility of making some very large arrays. Um, but there's still an awful lot to be learned in the field. And there's still a little more hype than I would like to see. I'd rather see more results and less publicity, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, that's a very, of course, that's a very difficult field, and, uh, yeah. but a very important <clears throat> field uh, for the future. So, well, uh, fine. Uh, well, this has been a fascinating exposition of the, uh, how this whole, whole field uh, developed and uh, in fact, uh
developed uh, in, in almost a very few years uh, uh, to the place where uh, people thought was absolutely impossible uh, <laughs> because primarily because of these micro circuits which are <clears throat> placed on chips yeah. and so on. Uh, I think. Uh, well, I can remember while I was working summers at General Railway Signal Company, there was somebody proving that no junction transistor would ever be used in a flip-flop that could mm -hmm. toggle faster than 100 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Well, today we use junction transistors in um, a variety of uh, circuits mm -hmm. that run at speeds where um, we used to call it UHF, and oh, we yeah. treat it like it's DC, we, you know, yeah. we, the speeds at which these circuits yeah. now operate. I mean, it's, uh, that's uh, amazing <laughs> how that. Uh, well, and uh, then of course uh, the uh, it was the <clears throat> junction transistor that uh, that really uh, made the, made the transistor mm -hmm. practical. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I guess the point contact ones we never never would have got uh, any place yeah. with. Uh, but, uh, well, this is, uh, as I say, it's uh, been a, uh, a revolutionary period in uh, in uh, the, the field of computer developments and its application to industry. Literally, almost no industry in the country now is mm -hmm. profoundly uh, affected, uh, and it's uh, all the way from its mechanical operations all the way to <coughs> towards its business yeah. strategy and everything else by computer technology. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that, that's been the most satisfying to see is the what I call the democratization of the computer. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the computer used to be this um, very special piece of equipment. It was locked away in its glass-enclosed oh, yeah. cage, and it was attended to by its elite core of oh, yeah. uh, specialists. And, a sort of priest, <coughs> priesthood almost. Right. And they used to tell the, the, you know, the president of the company oh, yeah. what could be done and what couldn't be done. Um, it had to do, I think, more with what they wanted to do oh, yeah. than anything else. And today, of course, we have more processing power than one of those computers had, you know, sitting on our, on our desktop. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's yeah. there for anyone to use. So it's the, the, the cultural implications of some of these things are... Are, uh, are interesting to contemplate. It's really changed the way we, we view computers. I know during my career I've had to approve uh, <coughs> uh, half a million here and a million and a half here for computers, you know, mm -hmm. and you try to delve in, you know, the, you know exactly uh, what this is going to be accomplished. And it, uh, mm -hmm. there was a gobbledygook that had developed that made mm -hmm. it awfully hard to penetrate uh, right. on right. some of these. Uh, <laughs> In spite of the fact I had an electronics background, mm -hmm. as I say, there was a great deal of mysticism built mm -hmm. up around this. Uh, uh, but uh, today, with the millions of, uh, of uh, computer programmers and uh, users and so on, there's uh, the, uh, uh, just the developments uh, just seem to uh, increase exponentially every year. Well, especially you get you know, young, creative people having access to computers. Um, there's, a, I think, a, a tendency sometimes we think of that, you know, only the specialist or the one with years and years of training is going to be able to accomplish something with the machine. But actually, oftentimes, it's the, the most interesting innovations come about uh, when there's a, an interaction between different disciplines. So you bring somebody into computers from another field. Oh yeah, you know, and that's where you'll are more likely to find uh, you know a new way of looking at the computer, and then perhaps getting it to do something else that it wasn't used for before. Yeah. <clears throat> well, as I say, you've been right through the most uh, most exciting uh, part of this uh, whole uh, <laughs> development, and uh, I certainly appreciate your. Uh, uh, giving your insight into uh, all of these developments. There's an awful lot of things I had never even heard of before, and so this has been very valuable for our series, and I want to thank you very much I, for participating in I, this. You're most welcome, and, and one, one thing, I just hope that uh, it's actually not been the most exciting. The excitement is still yet to come. It's, yes. uh, <laughs> There's no doubt that we just uh, 
uh, there's a new frontier every few years <laughs> right, in this. Yeah. Uh, fine. Well, very good. I think. Okay. That